so today we have uh, Suman Taneja who's with uh, uh, McKinsey here and uh, she will be talking about why applying design thinking to talent acquisition and management is a game changer. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Suman. And before we get going, maybe just a quick introduction. I'm Suman Taneja, I'm a partner at McKinsey and I am incredibly passionate about um, broadly digital, uh, digital transformations, but most importantly, the people and talent aspect of, uh, of organizations. And what I found is that organizations that start to think about people and talent management differently um, are really winning in this uh, war for talent than those that are continuing to do more of the same that, that they had, they've been doing so far. Wonderful. Um, so today, really, I just want to talk about why, you know, applying design thinking um, can be a game changer. I think, um, you know, it's not a new concept that we apply design thinking to building products all the time, but really extending the concept of design thinking to a whole new dimension with managing and acquiring talent in an organization. But before I dive into that, um, you know, helpful to ground ourselves in a bit of, bit of the fact base <clears throat> and what, what is uh, what are some of the challenges and things organizations are, are seeing and doing? What I found is those that have a digital ambition or have a digital uh, agenda, they have lots of choices to make around org and their people and their talent. Um, anything from how do you determine what are the skills I have in the organization to what do I need to um, stand out from competitors or uh, or others in the industry on what is it that's different about me and why to come work here, um, how to successfully source and find the right talent, um, or even, uh, you know, the most importantly, I think, the, the notion of how do I keep talent in my organization, especially with what we saw over the last two and a half, three years with the great attrition, the great attraction, which is, you know, now the, the great reshuffle and it continues. And so with that, with that backdrop, um, a little bit of fact grounding, right? As we, um, we've done some research and interviewed about 850 C-suite executives and asked them, what's the hardest thing about your digital transformation or achieving your digital agenda? And you can see here at the top came the notion of how difficult it is to find the talent that is needed to bring that to life. But let's look at the stats for a second. 60% of, at least in the, the, the Pharmaco CEOs, um, they were concerned about the digital talent shortage. 19% of executives are investing in digital capabilities at the moment. But well, let's look at the flip side. The typical cut of learning and training budget allocated to digital gets cut by 20%. And only 13% of organizations are getting creative on how to fix this problem. So the, the, the size of the problem and the attempts people are making to fix them just doesn't add up and it doesn't match up. And while, while that's surprising, it's actually, unfortunately, quite, quite true. Um, before, I, before I maybe go further, um, we'd love to hear a little bit from, from you on what are any challenges or specific topics that your organization or your region um, is seeing as it comes to, to digital talent. And I'm not sure if everyone can use the annotate feature <clears throat> in Zoom. If you can, maybe put a star or an asterisk or, a, uh, or something on one of these topics. And if you're not able to, maybe just use the chat feature to type in what is most top of mind, either for your organization, your region, or, or your team, or for you specifically, when you think about the notion of digital talent. I'm just gonna give you a minute to do that. All of the above, yeah. Any others? Give you another another few seconds. What I'm finding when I'm talking to to leaders and executives a lot um, is is very similar to one of the comments in chat. It really is. Um, 
it really is a, a mix of um, frankly, all of the all of the topics that fall under the talent management strategy. But I find hiring and attracting um, rises to the top of the list, just given our, our current landscape and all the shifts that our larger, broader context over the three years has, has put us in. Professionalism. Also seeing specific skills, remote versus office-based workforce. Yeah, the notion of remote and hybrid is certainly... Um, Certainly top of top of mind. Wonderful, I appreciate that. Let me move us forward for a second. Here we go. Uh, and some of you started to started to point towards this, right? It's really all of these talent topics are intertwined. Um, and as I as I think about the holistic talent strategy, it really goes across the four pillars. Anywhere from talent planning, which is knowing what you have in the organization versus what you need, hiring and onboarding, um, sourcing people, figuring out where to find them, how to attract them to the organization, having a clear selection and, and hiring process, like how do you actually test the skills that people have? And then once you do hire them and they accept the offer, how do you actually onboard and bring them onto the organization? And then the right hand side of the page, which is when I do have people in the organization, how do I actually manage and develop them? What do I do about compensation long term? How do I think about performance management, career paths, learning development? And then underlying all of that as an organization, how do I how do I make that data driven so that it's fact based and I'm making decisions that are helping me um, improve how I'm thinking about my talent in the organization? Now you're probably asking, well, what does all this have to do with design thinking? And what I want to do is, is tied for you um, to share that organizations that are winning on the talent front have shifted their thinking from thinking about all those things we looked at in the last page as processes to experiences. We live in an experiential world today. Everything from ordering a cup of coffee, getting your tea, to going to a theme park, to... Um, the way, the way we do online shopping, everything is an experience. And so why is it that where the one place where we spend 80 to 90% of our time, which is in our, in our work lives and in a professional setting, that all of a sudden the experience actually becomes more process focused and not necessarily experience focused. It's all about workflows. It's about um, needing approvals, going into the tools and clicking the right thing at the right time. It's about tools defining how processes work. Um, we're incredibly focused on efficiency versus really thinking about um, human centricity in, in, in the notion of people and talent. In the case of um, in, in the case of hiring and recruiting, your customer is really your candidate, right? In the case of talent management and talent development, your customer really is your employee. So why is it that we are so process focused when it comes to our people? versus experience focus and meet people where they where they need organizations to meet them. Those that are doing this well, um, they're actually innovating. They're innovating when it comes to their, their talent management. They are building cross-functional teams just as we would when we do um, product development. They are pushing the boundaries of what used to be um, traditional HR to, to new ways and new, um, new ideas on how you can actually solve some of the traditional problems that, that were solved in more process-oriented ways, but now in, in more human-centric ways. <clears throat> I'll, I'll take a second, and I, I assume many of you are familiar with design thinking, but I'll take a second to talk about design thinking um, and just ground us in how I think about it. Um, <clears throat> design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation. It always, always, always starts with the human need and the desirability. <clears throat> and then certainly the, the business viability, right? Then you start to layer in, well, in an ideal experience, this is what this is what we would want, and this is um, how we would expect things to happen. But really, is this going to actually move the needle? What impact is this really going to have on our business, on our people, on the way we work? <clears throat> and then layering in feasibility, like what may be great, great ideas and, and an amazing wish list has amazing business impact, but really is it feasible or not? And design thinking tends to help bring those three vectors together on like, where's the overlap? How do we actually make this, um, how do we actually make this feasible, possible and, and real? But really, really grounding ourselves in the, the human-centered uh, human approach. Mm -hmm. 
what I find is when you start this journey of applying design thinking to um, to a topic like people and talent, to a topic that is typically considered um, uh, potentially boring in, in the HR world, um, design thinking can really, really, really help. Um, but it does it does um, require one to one to think differently. It requires us to have a beginner's mind, to be curious, to be open to possibilities, to um, question the status quo, and remain optimistic. It's often easy to find all the problems in in the current space, but also um, just having the mindset of uh, innovation and having the mindset of being positive, being optimistic about we can find a better answer to it. Collaborative, experimental, I think um, for those of you that are familiar with design thinking, you'll know that it really embodies these, um, these guiding principles in, in the way it brings an experience to life. All right, let's take it to hiring and um, let's take it to hiring and recruiting. In the context of hiring and recruiting, one of the first things we wanna do is, um, is actually ground ourselves in the personas and understand the audience. And when we do this for products, right? We do the, we do the same exercise and we think about who is our customer. We think about what is the segment. We think about what the customer needs are. We think about how big that customer base is. Repeat the same exercise of identifying your personas, your customer base, what their needs are in the context of candidates, in the context of a recruiter, in the context of a hiring manager. And what I'll do next is actually take you through um, what a typical persona could look like in the context of in the context of hiring. So step one, create personas. This is important because we want to ground ourselves in in the shoes of the people we're trying to hire or bring on into the organization. Personas, for those of you not familiar, um, are not uh, they're not a demographic view of um, of who you're who you're who you're looking to target. They are much more about the archetypes, the types of um, the types of user groups or types of communities that you're that you're trying to understand, that you're trying to focus on. Um, these help you segment the market to a certain extent. They help you get sharper on if you, as an organization, are looking to hire someone. In this case, a product manager. Um, what are the types of things that are top of mind for product managers today? What are they thinking about? What will be most helpful for them as as me as an organization try to attract them to come work um, work into my company. And you can see here, um, you know, our, our fictitious um, uh, persona uh, talks quite a bit about where she is in, in, her, in her career path, in her, in her journey, both from a, what she's looking for in terms of work-life balance and ability to have a, uh, have a family, but also have a career. But also, um, what are some of the things that are, that are really, really important to her? Where is she going to look for jobs? Where is she? Um, how is she thinking about? Um, how is she thinking about the organization that she that she wants for and wants to work for? And then, what does she like and does not like about the process? Now, this is meant to represent a a, a set of users or a set of candidates. Um, that can then, as you think about your hiring and attracting journey, you can tailor and target it to what the personas actually need. You would do this exercise from a candidate lens. You would do this exercise from a recruiting uh, recruiter's lens. You would also do this exercise from a hiring manager's lens, right? To understand what each of those personas need from, from what would be now a journey, not a process on how we attract and bring, uh, bring talent into the organization. I'll, I'll pause for a second and, and just take a look at chat in case there's any questions um, and then and then maybe take us to step two. Oops, all right. Any questions so far? It's a little bit hard to 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 know because I'm I'm looking at the presentation and I can't see anyone's faces. So please, please chime in. Uh, nothing in the chat so far. Someone. Perfect. Thanks, Richard. And I was thinking of you when when I was thinking about this persona, given you're, you're a product manager in real life, um, on things top of mind for typical product managers. <laughs> Step two, um, understand the current state journey. Again, if you've done um, design thinking and journey work for products, applying that same concept to, um, to understanding what the current state journey looks like for a candidate, for a recruiter, for a hiring manager. 
And what this typically looks like is saying, sitting down with a, uh, with a group of uh, either focus group candidates or those that have just joined the organization and saying, let's go through phase by phase. What did it feel like for you to interview with our organization, to um, go through the process with us so we can understand where what it feels like from your perspective, not what the steps were. You know, we, you applied, then you interviewed, then you got a communication from the recruiter, then you um, got an offer, didn't get an offer. But really, let's talk about what did it feel like? What was the experience like for you when you did this? Most of the times I've done this exercise, what I find is the current state map looks something like what you're seeing on the, the page here. What it looks like is, um, depending on the organization's uh, you know, maturity on, on the recruiting processes, what it typically looks like is the, the beginning is excellent. There's a high, it feels great, good communications. But as, as individuals start to go through the process, frustrations come in or disappointments come in or there are moments of confusion or moments of lack of transparency. And then as they get through the, get through the closer to the end of the process in the hiring cycle, if the outcome was good, there's a peak in, in, uh, in how they felt. And then if they didn't get the offer, then there was a drop in how they felt. But understanding what the experience feels like from a candidate's point of view can really help understand um, how to tie the, the actual steps with the impact it's having on, on the candidates. Same thing for recruiters. Um, I find that often recruiters um, have a similar experience of I'm I'm not dealing with too many requisitions at the same time. I'm not sure um, how to engage hiring managers more closely. The market's really tight. I'm not sure what creative methods can I use. I feel like I can't necessarily make the decision, and I've got to ask a lot of people before before I can make the decision. Um, and then again, from a hiring manager standpoint, sometimes uh, often things on here are it takes too long to fill the position. I'm not sure why why it's taking so long the, the resumes I'm seeing don't meet the bar that I uh, that I set out uh, for the process I'm spending way too much time in the process than I think I should be and when you map these out and you typically map these out with the candidates recruiters and hiring managers there is a level of transparency that elevates uh, the the what's working and what's not working in, in the journey so step step one create the persona as understand who, 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 who these archetypes are, where they're coming from. Step two, laying out and understanding what the current state journey is. And to me, the, the most fun part to watch, you know, if you can't read all the details of it, is to just watch the emojis, right? And be able to see in, in, the, in the phases, and you only see source here, but then there's screen, then there's interview, then there's onboarding, then there's learning and development, then there's career path. You can start to see how people are feeling through, throughout the journey and what are the moments of uh, delight and where are the moments of frustration. So very kind of a, vis a very visual way to know um, how, people are, how people are feeling and, and what's going on. Step three, ideating. Um, and you know, design thinking really, really inspires us to, to think about ideation differently, to think about ideation um, and in a way that broadens the aperture and the solution space with how might we. And so this isn't, you know, how do we get this process to be more efficient from, well, you know, today it takes us three hours to do something. How do we get to one hour of doing something? Or today it takes us a week. How do we actually shorten the time to half a week or, you know, a day? It really um, forces you to open the aperture to say, how do I think about this problem completely differently? If I had a blank slate, how might I solve this problem? A round of those will, will typically in a workshop setting um, generate a, a ton of ideas that can then be used to form what I'll show you next is the reimagined future state journey. And the goal of um, the goal of kind of reimagining the, the future state journey is not to make sure that as you are thinking about future state ideas, that it is, you know peaks at all times, that there's just, you know, all you see is the happy emojis all the way across the board. The goal is to make sure that, A, the experience feels, um, feels if I can call it just calm and smooth, rather than a bit of the roller coaster of really good, I'm so confused, amazing, got a call, not so sure what to do next, but really having an experience that is 
um, that is consistent and positive most of you know, throughout the journey. But most importantly, there are some moments of delight. And moments of delight are essentially the places that organizations can typically use to be distinctive and be kind of the, um, be the thing that makes you stand out in your particular journey versus someone else's journey. And these moments of delights are what, um, you know, sometimes when you're taking, when you're, when you're taking a flight and you get a, you get a text message about, you know, where your luggage is and that it's landed safely and it's, you know, on belt number X. These are the little things that um, in your, for example, travel journey would, um, would potentially count as moments of delight of, oh, I didn't know, like, I could get this information and it's great that, like, I'm actually getting good news before I need to go find my luggage. Finding those moments of delight in, in the candidate and employee journey um, are really important. And what you're seeing on the screen is an example um, of, of a future state candidate journey that I that I helped build for an organization. And what it what it helped them do was not only um, not only do that for the candidate, also for the recruiting and hiring manager um, to be able to then say how do we balance this across all personas and not just focus on the candidate because we know recruiters and hiring managers are an important part of important part of this journey as well, and making sure that. There's synchronization points up and down across the across the journey. One thing I'll point out: you'll notice, um, for the sake of example, this is um, heavily focused on on hiring and recruiting. But you can imagine the 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 colors on the top that are showing the phases. They continue. They can keep continuing from a candidate journey to an employee journey. So you could imagine it's from sourcing to screening to interview to offer. Uh, to pre-onboarding, to onboarding, to the first, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, to the performance management cycle, to what the learning and development feels like, to what we want career paths to feel like, et cetera. So you could imagine this journey just continues um, all the way to, uh, you know, to alumni relations if, if you want to take it that far. Um, what, so, you know, often I get the question, great, like, I understand where I was, I understand where I want to be, what do I do next? Um, and for those of us that are that are in, um, in the business of building products, we know that um, we can define a vision for the product, but we, we, the, the way to get there is to, um, to get there in increments and iterations. And so the same concept applies to, to journeys, which is um, once you've defined the North Star, Define what the MVP is, we call it the MVJ, which is like the, the minimal viable journey that you want to start with, and then over time improve, improve that journey with, uh, with future iterations. Um, last page, and I'd love to open up for questions. Um, so, so what? So what if an organization goes ahead and does this? What are some of the things that feel different or what's the impact that this can that this can drive for organizations? Um, I took some snippets of examples that I've seen from, from companies that have done this well and, and what, what it felt like for, for individuals or candidates in that, in that organization. Um, applying design thinking helped, uh, helped several organizations take their time to fill from 60 to 90 days to less than two weeks. Less than two weeks to be able to meet a candidate and make a decision in less than two weeks because they optimized the, the, the experience from a candidate standpoint of not taking too long to make a decision. Um, the employee value proposition started showing up differently in job descriptions and interviews in the market because it was much more honest in capturing the, the way, why behind coming to work for that organization and uh, what does it feel like to, to be part of it. Um, recruiters were more empowered to make decisions uh, and and, uh, and and feel like they're part of, they're not just facilitating the process, but they are a decision maker in the process. Breaking silos between different parts, between compensation, between sourcing, between recruiting, between hiring managers, and really making it feel like one agile team. Um, think about it as, as a single kind of agile, agile pot. Um, and I think that in terms of, in some of, some, in terms of some of the harder metrics, um, retention rates go up. When you when you think about it differently and in this way, cost to hire comes down um, because you're doing you're thinking about it more from the standpoint of 
um, the candidate, and if candidate satisfaction goes up and hiring manager satisfaction goes up, and recruiter satisfaction goes up, there's a direct linkage with, um, with cost to hire. Employee satisfaction. Imagine meeting your employees where they are when they think about career paths, when they think about their learning journey, when they think about evaluation processes that are tailored to how people want to be evaluated, how they want to be thinking about their career paths. Employee satisfaction certainly goes up. And um, for me, last but not the least, it sets, uh, it puts the organization in a continuous improvement mindset of how do we think about this as experiences and journeys that are always evolving, that are always changing, that are always getting better. Um, so it's not the set it and forget it mindset, but really more uh, uh, continuous improvement mindset. With that, I will pause for, for any, any questions, any comments, any thoughts. This is triggered for you. So Suman, I think there's a, uh, there's a question uh, in the chat. And Joel is asking if you can give more example of, of minimum viable journey. Uh, yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so for example, a minimum viable journey, uh, let, me, let me give an example of what a North Star journey might be and then what the minimal, minimal viable version of that would look like. Um, so North Star journey, for example, for hiring might look like we can, um, we can source our candidates using AI and do scraping through LinkedIn and a bunch of other channels, and it actually produces a list of um, produces a list of candidates that we can automatically be, that can be automatically sourced for us, and we can then um, take we can then screen their profiles on GitHub and other places and be able to actually without even talking to the candidate be able to uh, gauge if this person's a good fit for us. A minimal viable journey process of that might look like, um, let's make sure that um, as we as we think about the candidate pools, we're looking at all the right places where we want to be sourcing from. Um, as we think about um, doing some automation around uh, around scraping their GitHub profile to be able to um, see if they're a good fit for us or not, Let's actually just start with recruiters manually looking at the GitHub profile, profile or the hiring managers looking at um, the, the profiles manually at, on GitHub before we actually automate the processes. So really taking the North Star and figuring out what is the smallest increment or progress we can make towards that North Star to be able to, um, to, be able to bring that journey to life. Because as you know, for even products, the vision's out there but you can't bring it all to life in the first, the first release. And so it's really just simplifying the journey to say, what are the smallest steps I can take to be able to get to, um, get to my North Star journey? I hope that helped. So Suman, uh, I would like to thank you for the, uh, for the session today. Uh, it was really insightful on how to, you know, uh, put design thinking in, in the recruiting framework. I mean, especially in, in, in today's environment, uh, where we we are, we are facing uh, uh, you know the resignations all across. It's it's good to uh, you know have a different mindset and and apply uh, try applying that and, and see how it helps. So so thanks for those uh, uh, thanks for sharing those uh, those with us. Mm -hmm.